Um, yeah, my name is Dave Sweet, and I'm the clinical lead for sepsis here at the BC Sepsis Network. I want to thank everyone for coming to this early lecture. And this is actually a lecture we've been really looking forward to over the last few months uh, by Mr. Paul Gowens. So Paul's had 20 years of experience with the Scottish Ambulance Service and is head of the clinical governance uh, quality and patient safety for Scotland. He was uh, one of the youngest paramedics in Scotland and went on to be one of the first paramedics in the UK to be awarded a diploma in into immediate medical care by the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, and which he is a founding member of their faculty of pre-hospital care. He has published widely in peer-reviewed journals, and he currently sits on the editorial board for the Emergency Medicine Journal, Medical Journal. And so today, Paul's here to tell us how uh, the Scottish Ambulance Service is using a pre-hospital sepsis screening tool that includes lactate monitoring to identify the critically ill patient and deteriorating patients. And, and this has been a hot topic for us with the BC Sepsis Network, and we've been looking at ways to improve our pre-hospital identification of sepsis patients. So, Paul, we're we are all really excited to hear you speak, and we, we thank you for coming today. Okay, thank you, and um, thank you for the opportunity to share some of the work. And I think one of the first things I want to say is it's very much um, other pe people's work. Uh, it, it's, it's not my own work. Um, we very much have a collaborative approach that's growing across um, primary care, secondary care, and the ambulance service. So a uh, quick bit of background. The Scottish Ambulance Service is a very large service. covers the whole of the country. It's a national ambulance service. Uh, 4,500 paramedics who are spread over 150 different locations. Uh, we ha operate four aircraft with a fifth aircraft coming on online in April, and we attend about 800,000 emergency calls. And I think from a, a pre-hospital point of view, um, trauma and MI have always been the sort of sexy subjects. Uh, and it wasn't until last June I was invited to go along to the Sepsis Collaborative, um, which was run by and um, Professor Kevin Rooney, and there was a few things came up at that uh, that really struck home with me. One was the amount of patients who um, suffer from sepsis, and then this big thing about uh, how important it is within an hour of diagnosis for these patients to be getting their antibiotics. Now, geography is not my strong point, and I'm sure BC has some of the same challenges we have in Scotland with weather and distance of travel. Uh, so the reality is, is if we don't give the antibiotics pre-hospital and we don't identify these patients early, the reality is we're never going to meet that one-hour target. I then uh, did a little piece of, of research and the Scottish Trauma Audit Group actually did a report on sepsis uh, in Scotland and 79% of the patients arrived um, either by road or by air ambulance to hospital. So, you know, 80% of these critically ill patients were coming into hospital by ambulance, and the majority of them would be taking longer than an hour for them to get into hospital. So, absolutely uh, the unknown killer, I would say, from a pre-hospital point of view. Um, moving on from that, very, very quickly, I became aware of World Sepsis Day, and I'm sure if anybody was involved in World Sepsis Day, you will uh, recognise this uh, poster and we took the poster and we used that to initially raise awareness of sepsis and I've got some slides coming up that will show some can everybody still hear me uh, we can hear you Paul um, I'm not sure why your slides are not advancing um, I think what we might have to do if we can't uh, fix this technical glitch is we may have to uh, advance your slides for you if that's no okay. Problem. Um, yeah, I think I need, sorry, I think I have control right now and I don't think I should. So if you could take okay. presenter back. Um, or give we will it to try Paul. that. Okay, it looks like I've got the presenter now. And yeah. um, Paul, I'm not sure why I can't pass it to you, which is fine. I'm just going to advance your slides for you. If you can let okay. me know which slide you're on, and then everyone on the call should be able to um, keep up with us. So if we go to slide number three. Okay. And I, and I, I can't see anything on my screen now, so I don't know what's happened with the link, but 
I'll just talk through um, my slides in front of me. Okay, sounds good. So, as I say, uh, World Sepsis Day came along, um, and I was involved with, uh, with presenting a poster across the Scottish Army Service, which re really just rose awareness. And uh, I'll share some information later in my presentation. That's just that raising of awareness with paramedics it had a really positive effect. If you look at the map of Scotland, though, you'll see the footprint for uh, the amount of area there where we can actually get patients to hospital within an hour. And although it's the, the high urban areas, there's vast amounts of Scotland where we can't. Uh, the East of England Ambulance Service were, were trialling a pre-hospital sepsis tool. And I'd been trying to use a pre-hospital lactate monitor. It had some challenges around effects of temperature and efficacy of results. Um, but we thought we would take that learning from others. And as a result of World Sepsis Day, if we advance the slides, Mary, um, it, w it was obvious that, you know, in Scotland, over in BC, and again, some work that was being done in New South Wales, uh, they had a the sepsis kills program, but we're also working on something called Between the Flags, which was uh, identified by ill and unwell patients. Um, whether they had sepsis or not. So there's already some pre-hospital work ongoing. And to be honest, we just stole it. Um, it took a bit of convincing uh, within the Scottish Ambulance Service that there was really a problem. So what we did, if you advance the slide, Marion, um, you can see what we did. We retrospectively looked at um, our cohort of patients and applied the SERS criteria for patients that we know had an infection and you can see the numbers there, you know, um, it was roughly around 5,000 patients a month we were identifying in Scotland that um, were SERS positive. Next slide. So what we did, we got a copy of the screening tool that was being used um, in East of England. And we developed that. We put it out with one paramedic, a guy called Mick McKenna in Falkirk. He took it out on one shift, applied it to one patient group, and then tweaked it, made sure it was fit for purpose. Uh, once Mick was happy with it, we then gave it to another paramedic team. They did the same, and we're now with the third iteration, which is the one that is in that has the red lines around the outside, and I'm quite happy to share that in Word format, and if anybody wants to take that away and, and use that, they're more than welcome to do so. So you couldn't really make it up, uh, going to the next slide. So the first day Mick goes out, um, he gets a treble nine call for a 75-year-old male, a GP's urgent call, so that's within four hours. They have within four hours to get that patient to hospital, that was the standard. As you can see there, the, the numbers weren't great. Um, his SPO2 was 86 on air. He was um, <clears throat> a wee bit on the temperature. The patient wasn't a diabetic, um, rests were up, GCS was down. But the key thing was Mick had this lactate monitor and was able to check the patient's lactate. And the lactate for the patient was um, 2.4. So on handover to the nursing staff, he was able to say, look, this patient's got SERS criteria positive and is septic. This is the lactate. And that was really well received within the receiving unit. It was communicating with the nursing staff in the unit uh, giving them information that they would normally have had to wait some time for. And in summary, you know, these are mixed words, not mine. You know, the machine was really easy to use. He was all, it was in addition to his standard patient assessment. And, you know, the, the standard of patient care for the pathway was started in the ambulance once the screening tool was used, and it was just continued throughout the patient's care. So next slide. So you can see, initially, um, these are patients who, from that one ambulance station, Falkirk, where we pre-alert the hospital and say at the hospital, look, we're coming in, and we think this patient's septic. And we just didn't, it just didn't happen. On the back of World Sepsis Day, raising the awareness, we were picking up between five and ten patients a week. And then once we introduced the lactate monitor, which, A, increased awareness, and B, I very much think if you give the paramedics the tools to do the job, then they'll do the job really well. 
you can see the steady increase back to the blue line in these patients that were picking up that are sepsis positive. What we're doing with the, the form is we're marking on that form, would we have given an antibiotic pre-hospital? And that's then being verified by the medical admissions unit or the ED. And very soon the paramedics will be given the antibiotic pre-hospital. Next slide. So how are we going to get the spread? Um, it's all right getting one or two paramedics in a rural location in Scotland to do the trial, but how are we going to get that across our 4,500 paramedics? Well, we're going to adopt the National Early Warning Score. And if you look at, your, at the slides, the light blue boxes and dark blue boxes is a screenshot from our electronic patient report form. So we're going to take that screening tool, build it into our electronic PRF, and for example, if you were to click pneumonia and then put the sepsis screening tool parameters in of um, BP, heart rate, etc., what will happen is uh, you will get a sepsis score. And if this, that sepsis score is above four, the screen will start flashing red and it will pre-alert. A, the crew, to think about, okay, this patient's septic, do we need to consider fluids, antibiotics, oxygen? but also that screen will be seen in the ED and in the medical admissions. So the medical staff and nursing staff will be aware what's coming uh, and what's on route to the hospital. Next slide. So as I say, this is very much a, an early piece of work, but a collaborative piece of work. We have the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, which is led by Kevin Mooney and Alison Hunter, and their information around sepsis and how we, we get that continuity of care from the first half healthcare provider getting to the patient, to the patient arriving um, within the acute receiving unit. Patient Aitles from East England Ambulance Service helped us very much with the early work around the, the screening tool. And where we're trialling this in Forth Valley, Dan Beckett has been instrumental in looking at the forms that we're putting in and verifying them. Colin Jira's assistant, we've put a screen in one of the hospitals in Fife. So as the crews fill out the electronic PRF, it alerts the screen in Fife. And within the Scottish Ambulance Service, Paul Ken Kelly and Mick McKenna are uh, very much the team in Falkirk who, who have pulled that together. And Rosalind Scott and Robin Lawrence are the IT team who are working with that. Uh, that's a quick run through, really. So I'm quite happy to take any questions. Um, I'm sorry I can't see any of the, um, of the hands going up or anything. I don't know what's happened with my commit connection, but I'm still here on the phone. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I'll be able to uh, watch for people raising their virtual hands or typing questions yeah. into the chat box, and I'll just direct the questions to you when they come up. Um, yeah. So just stay on the line, and um, uh, hopefully we can have some discussion here with the people on the call. Um, so a uh, hand up I see from Dave Sweet. Go ahead, Dave. Paul, fantastic talk. Um, that's some really interesting stuff that you're doing. Um, a, a couple questions that I thought I'd start this session off with. Um, so for your pre-hospital lactate, um, I didn't hear which monitor are you using right now for that screen? So we've been using that, the Accurid monitor, which is a small monitor, very much like a BM kit. Um, but that's opened the, the door, really, to us thinking about um, near patient testing and in the next couple of weeks we're going to move over and start using the iStat monitor which will give us a whole different range of, of pre-hospital um, results we can get but at the moment we're using the AccuRead monitor. Right, yeah, iStat's the one that we're, we've been considering as well. Um, and did you in this original, this, uh, this initial trial here, did you, did you try to confirm your lactate values? Like at any time did you compare um, your machine yeah. just as you arrived at the hospital, for example, with a lactate drawn by your lab to ensure that there's yeah. consistent results? Yeah, so we, uh, that's the piece of work Dan's been doing, and they were within um, 0.1 or 0.2 uh, when we got the first lactate from the hospital and compared it with the lactate pre-hospital. There was one discrepancy in the trial, but that was with a patient who had an extended transport time in the hospital of, a, of an hour. 
and that patient had had fluids and oxygen in air, there was a thought process here that the patient was responding well to treatment. Fantastic. Great. Thanks so much. So there's another question that came up in the chat, Paul. Um, the question was from Jean. Uh, what guides antibiotic selection, or is there an all-encompassing empiric choice? <clears throat> There's been uh, antibiotics has been probably the biggest bone of contention with the whole part of the trial. Um, I can uh, share with you the PGDs that we're, we're looking at, but basically what they're saying is is we're going to use uh, amoxicillin. Uh, some people think that's a good idea. Some people think it's not so good an idea. It's been very difficult to get consensus, um, so we're really looking to take guidance from from Evan Rooney. Uh, who's the, the clinical lead um, for Scottish Patient Safety Programme. But we're looking at amoxicillin at the moment, and then there's still a bit of debate about what, what we should use if a patient's um, allergic to penicillin. Great, thank you. Another question uh, from Michelle was, are you doing the fluid bol bolus also? Yeah, we are, we are giving the flu fluid bolus, yeah. Even if the patient's normal attentive, um, but it's serious uh, positive, and then um, has a lactate. We're, we're using lactate 2 as a, mar as a marker, so if a patient has a lactate higher than 2, they're getting fluid bolus. And how much fluid? 500 initially. 500 mm -hmm. mils of normal ceiling. Interesting. And uh, one, one, uh, one other question. Um, so when, when you just have the decision to give antibiotics, for example, um, so you have your screen where you're plugging in your new score, and then the emergency physician at the ED is also able to see that screen. And then at yeah. certain levels reached and the decision's made, yes, this person's probably septic, we should start fluids and antibiotics. Is that correct? Yeah, but that decision will be made by the paramedic. Um, although the, the ED physicians, et cetera, can see on the screen, um, the, the treatment pathway will be initiated by the paramedic. We already give... Um, pre-hospital antibiotics for a number of conditions like meningococcal septicemia, et cetera, so it's just going to build on that pathway. Oh, fascinating, really. And um, do you have multiple antibiotics available on your cart then, like such as cetraxone for the, the meningitis? Yes, yeah, so, so we, have, we have different um, grades of paramedic. So we have uh, sort of me out of the packet, Mark 1 paramedic, who can um, give a Benzo penicillin um, for meningococcal disease. Uh, and then you have paramedic practitioners who have a varying range of antibiotics that they can give for a variety of things from chest infections, localized infections, etc. And that's where we're getting the, um, the debate really about what is the best antibiotic to be given. Um, Pre hospital, and I say amoxicillin is coming out favorite at the moment. Wow, that's that's much different than our practice, but I think that's uh, that's really <laughs> that's fascinating. I, I wonder, you know, just as a comment, um, if there is some question about the choice of antibiotic in a in a, uh, a potentially septic patient, if there could be some some form of consultation or discussion with the pre-hospital service with the physician that's on uh, in the emergency room that's going to be uh, taking care of the patient after they arrive, for example, and coming to a decision together based on what clinical findings you have at the time. Yep, so what, what we have in place there is for, um, we have something what we call our professional professional line, which we use, um, and I mean, other examples I could give, so major trauma patients, you would have that discussion maybe about a destination to a major trauma centre, if it wasn't seemingly obvious, or indeed for your, your MI patient um, who was on the borderline for PCI or pre-hospital thrombolysis. So we have the infrastructure in place to have those professional professional conversations. Um, as I say at the moment, with regards to the antibiotics, it's, it's very much a paper exercise that's been verified by Dan and his team at Fort Valley before we get the position where they would be given antibiotics. But the, the professional professional line is definitely something that would be there as a support. Amazing. Fantastic. So there's another question that came up uh, in the chat um, from Paul Leslie. It says, great talk, Paul. What device are you using to obtain pre-hospital temperatures? We have a lot of controversy here regarding devices that can provide any accuracy at all. Yeah, so again, um, I think it's been really challenging 
um, especially in Scotland, and I'm sure you're the same with the effects of, of temperature on the batteries. Um, at the moment, we use a Braun the Tampanic thermometer, and we, rec- we recommend that the crews carry it in their pocket when they're on shift. Um, we had gone to temper dots for a period of time, but we found them to be inaccurate. Previous to that, we had used a different Tempanic thermometer, um, but we're now using the, the Braun B Tempanics, and we recommend that the crews carry them in, the, in their flight coat when they're on shift, and then put them in the, in the vehicle bag for storage when they're not on shift. And somebody else was wondering if you draw blood cultures in the field as well. Uh, we don't at the moment. Um, again, I think uh, once the, as the trail develops, I think as we move towards into the summer or into the autumn, um, and people are more comfortable with paramedics uh, pick it, picking up on, on this disease pre-hospital, I think we will be taking cultures. The paramedic practitioners that I've talked about do take cultures for, for other reasons uh, in remote and rural locations in Scotland. So I think it will just be a natural evolution that will be over in the the sepsis six probably apart from the, the catheterization in the pre hospital field. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, we still have some time, so um if while you're thinking of questions, um I'm just going to get back to um, some other slides here. And I wanted to point out um, some resources that are available in British Columbia here. So we have formed uh, the BC Sepsis Network. And the BC Sepsis Network was formed last June. Um, it's made up of mostly uh, emergency department clinicians, uh, ED physicians, ED nurses, um, respiratory therapists, lab techs, uh, some frontline care providers, um, as well as quality improvement people and uh, administrators, managers, etc. Mostly focused in the emergency department for now, we're looking at improving uh, sepsis care in British Columbia. So we've done a lot of work around quality improvement, um, providing education, providing resources, and we would really like to encourage any paramedics who are on our call today to join the BC Sepsis Network. Um, you can find out more about our sepsis improvement initiative in BC by going to www.bcsepsis.ca. Um, and if you look on the left side of your screen there, you'll see that there's a subheading about the BC Sepsis Network to read a little bit more. But I'd really encourage the paramedics here today to, to join the BC Sepsis Network. Um, there's no commitment, but you will be notified of, of any of our online learning sessions that we offer, um, usually on a monthly basis. Um, and we will be able to keep in touch about sepsis resources that come up and sepsis improvement initiatives. And it's just a way of staying connected with emergency departments and um, uh, people in the acute care hospital world who are working on sepsis throughout our province. Um, another few questions that have come up in the chat. Let me just refer to these. Uh, from Andy Fletcher, uh, says, thanks, Paul. Were you using venous samples for the lactate or capillary samples? Capillary samples uh, on the AccuTrend monitor, and once we start using the ISAT monitor, we'll probably go into venous samples because the idea is we'd be getting uh, venous access, taking cultures uh, all at the same time. So, you know, one risk of in- introducing infection to the patient. Great. Um, lots of other questions coming up here. One from Tom says, is there any hospital bypass by ambulances to preferred hospitals or sepsis centres? No, um, it's the, the nearest ED medical assessment unit. Okay, I think it's the same here in British Columbia. Um, Michelle asks, what has been the financial impact of lactate monitoring? I think this is a really pertinent question for British Columbia. So, so at the moment, um, we've only been, remember we're doing a small scale trial in, in one location. So um, we've had the monitors, et cetera, for, for free. So it was one, one day's training time for the five guys. So it's been, it's been minimal at the moment. Great. Um, there's another question that's come up. Um, are you tracking outcomes or adverse outcomes? 
Yeah, so um, that that's the piece of work that's ongoing at the moment. So out of the patients we've talked about, we've had, I think it's 22 patients who, um, when they've had their lactate monitor, they've had their fluids and stuff, got into the, the receiving unit, ha have found to be, um, you know, truly septic and unwell. Uh, and we are following no, those outcomes. Uh, what we have been able to measure is the time to the patient getting fluids, uh, and that's reduced obviously significantly with them getting the fluids pre-hospital. They're still having to wait to get the antibiotic till they get in the door at the moment. Okay. Uh, question from Travis. Was there any onset time frames as to the source of the infection that you were that, that were of concern, or were you initiating your protocol based on the assessment at the time? So we're uh, initiating the protocol on the assessment at the time for the majority of patients, although some patients will have been recognised by the a doctor going out. We have a GP. I don't know what, what the, the similar thing is, but the family doctor going out, finding somebody unwell and calling for an ambulance. And again, something we're trying to put in place is if you remember back to the case study, uh, that was an urgent call, so that was within four hours for that that um, for a patient. So we're now working with primary care to see if they identify, they're using our screening tool, and if they identify the patient is serves positive, that the uh, order for the ambulance will be an emergency call will, and will guarantee to be in hospital within the hour. Okay, thank you. Um, one other thing I'm, I'm going to point out, I just brought up another slide on the screen here. Um, this is our referring you to our online community of practice that we've developed. Um, it's early stages of using this tool, um, and we're, we're working on improving it. But essentially, it's an, online, it's an online community where we can talk about sepsis, share resources. Um, we, we post events in here in the sepsis community. We um, upload recordings from today's call, um, and we invite others to, sh to share resources that they've developed at different hospitals throughout BC, um, and discuss ideas and, and ask questions uh, of each other. So if you're interested in getting involved in that, the web address is www.qexchange.ca, and that's um, uh, QExchange is an initiative of the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council. Um, let me read out a couple of other questions. We've still got some time left on today's call. Uh, Michelle asks, will you be publishing your results, and if so, where? Yeah, so um, as I say, Kevin Rooney, who's been the, the, the lead really in, in Scotland from the medic point of view, um, is very keen that we do that. So uh, I don't know where we'll be um, publishing our results, but there's, there's definite... Um, within the thought processes once we get Dan to do the sort of follow up work on the follow up data for these patients to to get stuff uh, out there and publish and, and, and just share the learning really, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, Jean asks, after the study and protocol are well established, would there be any consideration of including pediatric patients to some degree? Yes, so um, Again, my background is I'm doing a Scottish Patient Safety Program Fellowship at the moment um, using early warning scores to identify ill patients and using sepsis as my tracer condition. One of my colleagues on the program is doing exactly the same for paediatrics. That's great. And I know you, you um, indicated, Paul, that you'd be happy to share um, your slides from today's call, that you'd be happy to share uh, some of the documents and screening tools that you've developed. Um, and uh, thanks for sending me all those resources. So I've got them here. Um, I have just brought up our email address here on the screen. Uh, if you would like copies of the screening tools and uh, some of the resources and things and the slides from today's call, um, feel free to get in touch with us here at the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council. Um, you can find us at sepsis at bcpsqc.ca um, or through Twitter at bcsepsis, and we, we tweet from that account. Um, 
so welcoming any, anyone to sort of get in touch to learn more about the BC Sepsis Network, to um, get some of the resources that Paul has offered to share with us today, um, and to just learn more about what we're doing. And we're all also interested in hearing from the paramedics on the call today how they think this might work in British Columbia, or if they think this might work. Um, really interested in having you share some of those perspectives with us. Um, and having you involved in some of the sepsis improvement work that's going on in emergency departments throughout BC. We have, as I said, the BC Sepsis Network has a core group of leaders throughout the province, um, and we can connect you with them in uh, most of the uh, mid to large size emergency departments across British Columbia so that you can get in touch with them and um, talk about sepsis improvement in your particular area. Are there any more questions for our presenter today or for uh, Dr. David Sweet, who's um, uh, a local emergency department uh, physician and ICU physician here in Vancouver? Nope. Okay, I don't know. Well, sure, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just, okay. was there another question? Uh, no, I think that was it, Dave, go ahead. Okay, well, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming on the call on behalf of the network. And, Paul, that was a, a fantastic talk. And I, I really think you are, are uh, pushing the limits. And, you know, this kind of stuff is the future of sepsis care. And we know um, without question now that earlier management is better um, than delayed management. And you're just taking the treatment right to the patient's, to the patient's home and um, initiating as soon as possible. So I, I just congratulate you on this work and being one of the leaders in the world on uh, early sepsis management. Thanks so much for the talk. No problem. I might say if there can be any help, any want us to share anything, that's fine. Just contact through, through Shari. Great. Thanks again, Paul. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, get in touch, sepsis at bcpsqc.ca. And uh, have a good day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Bye.